Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that is so frustrating and I know all of you are going to have very strong feelings on this one and I also think a lot of people are going to have a lot of mixed opinions as well. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Acorn TV. Acorn TV is the largest commercial-free British streaming service that offers amazing stories, exclusive Exclusive premieres and originals that you can't find anywhere else. Acorn TV has hundreds of exclusive shows from around the world, including award winning mysteries, dramas, comedies, and so many more. Acorn TV is loaded with thousands of hours of binge worthy content, and there is always something new to watch. It's nice to have a new streaming service now that it seems like everyone's watched basically every other show on other platforms within the past year. I know I have. Now, one of the shows that intrigued me about Acorn TV and totally has me hooked is Finding Alice. It's about Alice who moved into a newly furnished smart home with her partner of 20 years, Harry, who actually designed the home himself. But Harry actually died after falling down the stairs in this brand new house, so Alice just has to go on with this new sense of loss and abandonment. This show is a contemporary drama about a woman's honest, raw, and dark comedic journey about grief, love, and life after the loss of her beloved partner. Acorn TV is accessible to almost anybody by downloading the Acorn TV app either onto Apple or Android devices, or it can be streamed on Amazon Fire TV or downloading Google Chromecast, Roku, and so many more. Again, Acorn TV is commercial free and you can get it for only $5.99 a month. With Acorn TV, there's always something new to discover. You can try Acorn TV for free for 30 days by going to acorntv.com and using code Rachel Shannon. Promo codes are case sensitive, so make sure you go ahead and enter that code in all lowercase letters. Thank you again so much to Acorn TV for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the mysterious death of Tanner Ward. Tanner Ward was born on September 7th, 1999 to parents Lisa and Curtis Ward and had two siblings, a sister named Kelsey and a brother named Tyler. They all grew up and lived in the small town of Trenton, Missouri. Trenton is described as one of those small towns where everyone knows everyone. If you cross paths with someone, you wave at them as they walk by. The family described it as an old-fashioned kind of town since that seems to be something that people just simply don't do anymore. Now, Tanner was known to have sort of a rough time in his teen years. He had struggled with drugs and was hanging out with people who just weren't good for him. But right before his death, he seemed to be picking himself back up and was starting to head in the right direction. He absolutely loved his fiance Megan. His family said that the two had an amazing relationship and he would go out of his way to do anything for her. The two had also recently welcomed a baby girl into their lives who they named Sophia, and his life absolutely revolved around his little girl. Even though he was only 19 years old when he became a father, that didn't stop him from being the absolute best dad that he could. Now, on June 7th, 2017, Tanner had just been hanging at home, hanging out with his family for the day when he decided that he was going to go visit a friend. Before leaving, his mother told him that she was going to be throwing some chicken on the grill and fixing up a salad and asked him if he was going to be home for dinner that night. So, he told her that he was only going to be gone for about 30 minutes and asked her to fix him a plate. Now, before he he left, his mother asked him what friend it was that he was going to be seeing, and he told her that it was his friend Jeremiah. Now, like I said, this was a small town where everyone knows everyone, but no one in his family had ever heard the name Jeremiah. They had never even heard Tanner bringing him up before or ever hanging out with him before this day. But either way, at the time, his family didn't really think much of this, so he was on his way. He kissed his daughter goodbye, and then he left to go see his friend. However, hours started to pass and his dinner was starting to get cold and his family was wondering where he was and what was taking him so long. This was very unlike him and his mother was starting to get really worried. Now, as far as I've seen, Tanner didn't actually have a cell phone or any other way to contact him, so no one ever really knew what he was doing until he got home and told them where he was. So they didn't really have a way of contacting him and asking him where he was, so they sort of just were sitting at home and 
waiting for him to get back. But their worries grew into an absolute panic when the next day rolled around and he still hadn't been home and hadn't gotten into contact with anyone. So immediately, Kelsey, Tanner's sister, started to put together sort of a timeline to figure out who this Jeremiah person was and where he lived. She did this in hopes that she would go to Jeremiah's house, find Tanner there sleeping or whatever he was doing, and tell him to get his butt home to ease his mother's worries. She asked everybody that she could think of to figure out who he was until she did ultimately figure out who this person was and where he lived. So she went to Jeremiah's apartment and knocked on the door, but nobody answered. But the door was unlocked, so she sort of just let herself in, going off of the assumption that people were probably still just sleeping inside. But what she walked into was very concerning. The apartment was an absolute disaster. The inside of the apartment was a total mess. The back door was left wide open. Furniture had been thrown all over the place and there was a massive hole in the wall. She could tell from the moment that she walked in that there had been an intense physical altercation in that apartment. She started walking around the place and just looking around and she realized that nobody was home. But as she was walking around the apartment, she noticed that Tanner's baseball cap was laying in the middle of the floor and her heart absolutely dropped and she stopped dead in her tracks. She knew that Tanner would not leave anywhere without this hat. He was constantly wearing it and he would never forget it anywhere. So once she found this cap, she knew that something was up and so she headed directly to the police station with cap in hand to report Tanner as missing. But of course, as I say in pretty much every video here and probably as you expected, when Kelsey got to the police station, police basically told her that she was overreacting and that he would be back soon. They assured Kelsey that they would look into it, but told her not to overreact because he probably just ran away, was probably out just hanging out with some girl and getting his mind right. They said that everything was going to be completely fine, but Kelsey knew that this was not her brother. He definitely would not just up and leave like that, especially after telling his family that he was only going to be gone for 30 minutes and specifically asking his mom to make him a plate. And of course, he loved his daughter and he would never up and leave her like that either. Again, police assured the family that they were looking into everything and that they would do whatever they could to bring Tanner home. But then, two weeks passed with absolutely no movement in the case, so the family started doing their own searches for Tanner. So, Kelsey got to work and started putting up flyers all around the area in Trenton and all around the surrounding towns. But as she was doing this, she actually ran in to Jeremiah. And at this time, he was wearing Tanner's shirt. Not just any of Tanner's shirts, but the exact shirt that Tanner was last seen in before he went missing. Kelsey recognized it immediately, so of course she confronted him and asked him why in the world he was wearing her brother's shirt. Then, once she got closer to him, she noticed that there were strange marks on the shirt as well. To Kelsey, these looked like cigarette burn holes all over the shirt. So she asked him, what the heck is all over my brother's shirt? And he responded with nothing, they're just little stains. And she replied, those don't look like stains to me, I'm calling police. And Jeremiah replied by saying that he would just meet her at the police station, so there was no need. When they got there and started talking to police, immediately they said that they wanted to do some forensic testing on this t-shirt. But Jeremiah was not so quick to give up this shirt. He would not willingly give this shirt to police for testing, so they basically had to take it from him. After they went ahead and tested these stains, though, unfortunately, they could not determine if these spots were blood or what really did cause them. Then they had went ahead and conducted a voice stress test on Jeremiah. So a voice stress test is similar to a polygraph test, but it seems to be less accurate, but a quicker way of determining if somebody is lying. The person basically speaks into a microphone and the microphone will pick up on nonverbal frequencies of the person's voice to try and detect a deception. Again, it's not the most accurate thing. It's not even quite as accurate as a polygraph test, which we know even polygraph tests aren't the most accurate thing, but in Jeremiah's case, 
The results of the voice stress test were so convincing that they gave police the means to go ahead and search a property in Edinburgh around 10 miles away from Trenton that belonged to Jeremiah's father. So when police did their search, they brought cadaver dogs and immediately the dogs hit on a burn pile that was located right outside of the back door of the home. So they conducted a forensic dig on that site, which was about six feet by 10 feet big. They did end up finding a bunch of little bones in this burn pit, but after further examination, those bones came back as belonging to animals, not humans. So Obviously, there wasn't really anything that they got from this search. So over the following six months, police continued following up on leads and the family continued searching for Tanner desperately. And like I said, Tanner didn't even have a cell phone, so there was no way that they could search for him using any sort of cell phone data or digital forensics. Police and the family also tried interviewing whoever they could, but they didn't really get much from that either. It seemed like all of Tanner's friends and everyone in his inner circle were too afraid to speak with police because they didn't want to get themselves in trouble for whatever other illegal activities that they were involved in, whether they were related to Tanner's case or not. Police conceded that at this point, foul play was definitely a possibility and they didn't want to rule anything out. But a lot of the tips that they were getting and a lot of the information that they were getting just did not seem to be helpful and didn't seem to be accurate. Police said that they received numerous tips and numerous leads, but said that most of the information that they received was, quote, misinformation, speculation, conjecture, and rumors. But absolutely nothing was found until six months later when the family was faced with their absolute worst nightmare and the absolute worst outcome for their son's case. At around 7.30 a.m. on December 4th, 2017, two high school students were on their way to school walking in a wooded area near Shanklin Avenue when they discovered a decomposing body hanging from a 25-foot tall tree near an abandoned grain elevator about three blocks away from Tanner's family home. And of course, this body was confirmed by Tanner's family as belonging to 19-year-old Tanner Ward. When his body was discovered, they found that his fingers had been mummified and his feet were missing from his body. They also found a small pile of clothing on the ground at the base of the tree, which included pants, shoes, and a sock not a pair of socks, just one single sock. The condition of this clothing indicated that the clothing had been there for quite some time. These apparently were the clothes that Tanner was last seen in when he went missing. So an autopsy was done on Tanner's body by a forensic firm in Kansas City, and the medical examiner actually concluded that his death was the result of suicide. The medical examiner stated that there was no suspension of Tanner's body by anybody but himself, and said that the bark on the tree had not been disturbed and there was no evidence of a sawing or sliding action of the rope across the bark. They said that he was still wearing a t-shirt and jeans at the time of his death and they were apparently the same ones that he was last seen in when he went missing. Now, just as a side note, as I mentioned before, it was reported that there was a pair of pants laying on the ground underneath his body at the base of the tree, but then other articles reported that he was still wearing pants. So my assumption is that one of these reports is wrong because I haven't seen anywhere else that a random pair of pants were found at the scene. I also want to note that the conclusion of him wearing the same clothes that he was last seen in the day he went missing contradicts what Kelsey said earlier about seeing Jeremiah wearing Tanner's t-shirt. I don't know if this was the same t-shirt or if it was a different one than the one that Jeremiah was wearing, but I assume it had to have been a different one since Jeremiah handed the shirt over to police. So not to get ahead of myself here, but I do want to point out some contradictions that I think are weird and I haven't really seen addressed anywhere else. So it could mean to me that Kelsey is either misremembering what he was last seen in or that Jeremiah and Tanner just happened to have the same exact matching shirts or that he changed shirts before his death and the coroner just said that it was the last one that he was wearing before he died because it wasn't necessarily the one that he was last seen in, but maybe concluded that he died in that shirt. So I'm not quite sure if it was a different shirt or the same shirt as the one that Kelsey saw. 
I honestly don't know, and again, I haven't seen it addressed anywhere else. Then, when it comes to Tanner's feet being missing, the coroner determined that this was because of the way that his body was hanging for so long that his feet would have just fallen off during the decomposition process. But then I wonder if the shoes found beneath his body had feet in them, or if they didn't, or if they were completely empty. To me, it seems like they were just shoes with no feet in them because I didn't see it mentioned anywhere that decomposing feet were found within the shoes. So it makes me wonder if he did hang himself, did he take the shoes off before doing so? Did the shoes fall off before his feet fell off and animals just took the feet and not the shoes? Because to me, if the feet fell off while wearing the shoes, I don't think that there's any way that an animal could carefully go in and, and take the foot out of the shoe and then just scurry away with the foot without causing any damage to the shoe. They would have just picked up the entire thing and taken the shoe with them and then ripped through the shoe to get to the foot, which is the meat that they want to eat and what they want to get away with. But then I've also heard sources that the feet fell off because of the weight of the shoes. So if that were the case, then the feet would still have to be inside of the shoes. So I don't really understand how the situation would have happened of them finding a pair of shoes under his body and then his feet being missing. So meaning that they didn't find the feet in the shoes when the feet fell off because they were in these heavy shoes. I really don't understand that. So if anyone knows more, maybe if the articles were just wrong about the shoes being found there, I'm not sure, but this part of that just does not make any sense to me. But either way, because of the autopsy ruling, this obviously meant that even though police were looking into Jeremiah initially as a person of interest, this means that he no longer could be considered for any sort of wrongdoing. But Tanner's family does not believe that he died as the result of suicide. His mom came out and said that him taking his own life just does not make any sense. There was no reason for anybody in his life to think that he was suicidal. He had so much to live for. He had a baby daughter who he absolutely loved and he was engaged and excited to get married. He was starting to get his life back on track after struggling for so many years and if someone had thoughts of taking their own life, why would they put all of this effort into bettering themselves if they knew that their life was going to end soon? He didn't show any signs of wanting to take his own life either. He was making plans for Father's Day weekend. His own father was on deployment at the time and he was really excited and making plans for Father's Day when his father came back and he finally got to see him. One telltale sign of someone wanting to take their own life is not wanting to make future plans and he put so much effort into planning things and he was really excited for things that were coming up. His family believed that somebody killed him, straight up. His mother said, sure, if she saw any signs or if she saw him struggling or even if he had written a note that she could accept what happened. So this isn't a case of a family who is just refusing to accept reality. They know that there are signs pointing towards someone hurting him intentionally. Think back to Jeremiah's apartment and how there were clear signs of a violent struggle. How nobody could get into contact with Jeremiah or find him for over two weeks weeks after the disappearance. How he was so hesitant to give his shirt up to police. There are so many signs that point into the direction of foul play that it's just impossible for the family to ignore. So after this, rumors started to spread like wildfire around the town of Trenton. People started to text Kelsey about ideas of what could have happened to Tanner and Lisa, his mother, was also constantly receiving messages from so many people from Tanner's friends to complete strangers all giving her rumors and ideas that Tanner's death may have been a homicide, not a suicide. Some of these rumors said that Tanner may have been tortured for months and then was killed and then was stored into a freezer for an extended period of time. Another said that he was beaten with a baseball bat, hung up in a cellar, and then was taken to the tree to later stage a suicide. And it's not just rumors that points away from the suicide theories. There's actual evidence that points towards Hannah not being 
being hung in that tree for the full six months, like police have stated. So earlier, I kind of touched on the idea of wildlife taking Tanner's feet and moving them to a different location after they disconnected from his body. But that brings up another idea that Kelsey brought up. If he was hanging there in the woods for the entire six months, there would have been signs of some sort of wildlife messing with his body, whether it be bugs or squirrels or birds, whatever. But there was absolutely no sign whatsoever of wildlife interacting with his body, not of them trying to eat him or burrow in him, which I know is very gruesome, but that's what happens when there's a body out in the woods for an extended period of time. But no evidence of that was found on Tanner's body, so that was very, very strange. Then construction workers from the area came forward to say that they didn't believe Tanner's body was in that tree until the day he was found. So, they actually used a storage building that was located only 25 feet away from where Tanner's body was found. You would think that if he was hanging there for this entire six months, especially during the summer, decomposing to a point where his feet were falling off of his body, that they would have noticed something or, at the very least, smelt the very foul odor. Then I wonder about the high schoolers who actually found him. The reason that they found him was because they were walking through the woods to get to school, which I believe was their normal route, or at least a route that they had taken several times before. School would have started in either August or September, meaning that those kids would have walked past his body every morning five times a week for five or six months without noticing his body. How did they go all of that time without noticing anything? They were even asked if it was possible that they took this route before and didn't notice his body before, and they said no. There's there's no way that they would have missed him on their previous routes to school. Other friends of Tanner's and his family have come out to say that they have walked the path right by that tree several times after Tanner's disappearance and they didn't see him either. One of Kelsey's friends even came out and said that she had played with her son in the woods under that exact tree several times within that six months and she never noticed anything. It's just crazy that in such a small town with several people regularly passing that tree, even working 25 feet away from that tree, that absolutely nobody saw him or smelled anything. Then, about a year after his disappearance, his case was covered on the show True Crime Daily. And this show came forward with even more evidence pointing towards Tanner's body not being hung in that tree for the entire six months. So, like I said earlier, when they found Tanner's body, his fingers were mummified. Now, when I originally read this, I was a bit confused, but what they meant by this was natural mummification. Natural mummification occurs when the skin and organs of a dead animal or human are preserved without going through the normal process of using chemicals and other preservation tools that humans can use to artificially preserve a body. This natural mummification process typically happens when someone's body is exposed to a frigid cold or oxygen poor conditions for an extended period of time. So, it's really weird that Tanner's fingers would have gone through a natural mummification when his body was allegedly left in a very hot, moist, humid climate in the Missouri summer. A forest in Missouri is going to be a humid, wet, and oxygen-rich environment which completely contradicts how a body is typically naturally mummified. So, if we know that what happened to Tanner's body typically happens in cold and oxygen-poor environments, then we can gather that maybe this supports the family's theory that he was beaten and left in a freezer for an extended period of time before being hung in that tree. But then another forensic expert came out with his explanation of what could have caused this condition of Tanner's body. So apparently Tanner's neck had elongated from the gravity of pulling the weight down from the body hanging after an extended period of time. Then he came out and said that it is possible for this mummification process to happen in very hot, moist environments. Now, of course, I am in no means an expert on this, but I did look more into this process since I wanted to understand more, and I read articles that explain this process in a very unbiased way that are completely unrelated to this case. And literally every other article that I read said 
that the mummification process happens in the conditions that I discussed earlier. So for an expert to come out and say that in Tanner's case, the mummification process happened with the exact opposite conditions is really confusing to me. So I just don't really know what to make of that. I don't know if I believe him or not. It just seems a little bit strange. He also said that his explanation for why so many people could have walked past the tree without finding him for so long is because when people are walking, they are generally looking down. And so that in a combination with the foliage covering his body, it makes sense that nobody found him. But then on the other hand, again, using my own personal experience, I think it's a jump to say that, oh, everybody is always looking down all of the time and that's why nobody saw him. He went on to say that people in the store generally don't see what's on the tops of the shelves because people generally are looking down and not looking up when they're walking around. Now, maybe I'm the outlier here, but when I'm in the woods or in the store, I'm looking up and all around and I'm not always looking down. I'm constantly looking and wandering around as I'm walking. I'd go as far as saying, especially when I'm in the woods, I am looking up more than I'm looking down unless I'm worried about tripping over something or something like that, then obviously I'm looking down to watch my step. Or if I'm on my phone, obviously I'm looking down at my phone, but I don't know, I'm not always looking down. There's a lot of times where I'm up and looking around. This explanation could be possible for why the high school students didn't see him as they were walking past because if they're just trying to walk fast and get to school as quickly as possible then maybe they're just you know eyes forward walking straight and not really looking around but I imagine if people are in the woods to play with their kids or because they want to look at nature they're not just going to be looking down the whole time if I'm going on a hike even if it's somewhere that I've been a couple of times I'm not just going to look down at the ground the whole time because I'm going to miss whatever's out there. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments if you agree with me that you're not constantly looking down or if you think that I am the outlier and that you are usually looking down when you're walking around. The other thing that he didn't address, again, is the smell. Sure, maybe people wouldn't just have naturally seen him if they were walking around. You can make that argument. And even if we do believe that argument 100%, bodies start to smell absolutely foul when they're decomposing. And we know that hot and humid moist environments speeds up the decomposition process. Again, using my own personal anecdote here, but I know that if I smell something really bad, I start looking around to figure out what exactly is causing this disgusting smell. I can point to my own anecdote. Literally this morning, I took my dog to the dog park and I smelled something absolutely disgusting and I looked around and I couldn't figure out what the smell was and it only smelled bad in this one specific spot and I thought that of course it was just probably dog poop that was sitting around because it's a dog park but I didn't see anything and I was looking for the smell because it was so disgusting. Again, maybe it's just me, but when I notice that something smells really bad to me, I want to figure out the source. But even then, you can argue that maybe when someone entered the woods, if they did smell something this foul, that they just turned around and left because they didn't want to deal with the smell. But even then, you would think that knowing how small of a town this is, if people remembered smelling something that bad, that they would come forward to put the family's mind at ease. I feel like even if I wanted to hide my illegal activity or if I didn't want to talk to police, or whatever other reason that I might have for not wanting to come forward with other information, if I smelled something in that area of the woods, and this family was out there concerned that their son may not have actually been in the woods that entire time, I'd at least call in and be like, hey, I know that there's questions about whether this body was in the woods or not, and I don't know if this helps, but I think it's possible that that's what I smelled because I remember smelling something really, really foul around this time, or just something like that. I don't know, maybe it's just me, and if this were a bigger town, I could see how someone wouldn't really make this connection between just a foul smell and you know someone's body being discovered but again this is such a small town everybody knows what happened to tanner everybody's coming up with all of these rumors about what could have happened so i feel like there's reasons for these rumors but i feel like if there were people who really just wanted this family to find the closure that they deserve that they would come out and say hey i know this is really tough i know you know you're still trying to figure out what really happened but if this helps i did notice this smell around this time 
Maybe people did come forward with that, I don't know, but that's just one of my thoughts. So more information started coming out about Tanner's behaviors before his death and one incident in particular that left the family very concerned. Police came out and said that Tanner wasn't actually clean from drugs and he wasn't actually getting his life back on track, but that he was still using drugs heavily and that he was using whatever he could get his hands on. So to me, what I get from this statement from police is police were basically saying that, look, since he's still using drugs, it is possible that he took his own life because he wasn't getting back on track like everybody thought he was. It got completely out of control, or maybe he took his own life in some sort of drug-induced psychosis. But to me and to the family, this actually gives a little bit more indication that he may have actually been killed. Kelsey admitted that he was a regular pot user, which isn't usually a big deal in most states, and it's legal now, and it's really not a big problem, but he did have a run-in with the law. So back in 2016, Tanner and his brother Tyler had actually been in a situation where they entered a house with guns because of some sort of dispute over a drug deal. Tyler had apparently entered the house and would not allow anybody to leave, holding Jeremiah, his upstairs neighbor, Stephanie, and Stephanie's daughter hostage. Again, all over a drug deal gone wrong type of situation. Of course, Jeremiah and Stephanie were not happy because of this situation at all, and Tanner did end up with a felony charge because of this, and he ended up with probation. But according to a rumor that somebody told Lisa, Tanner's mother, this 2016 incident is actually what led Jeremiah to killing Tanner in retaliation. They said that they had a plan to rough up Tanner and not actually kill him. They said that they didn't actually have plans to kill him, but that he fought back so hard that things just got out of control and that he ended up being killed and then this entire thing was staged as a suicide. But police came out and said that there's absolutely no evidence of him being hit with a baseball bat and tortured like the family believes. Police said that there's no physical evidence on his body that he was beaten or had died in any other way other than hanging himself. So they're sticking to the conclusion that he hung himself and took his own life. Police came out and said that a lot of the rumors going around are only hurting the investigation and are only adding fuel to the fire. He said that a lot of the theoretical information being put out onto social media is false, cruel, dangerous, and on some levels, it's slanderous. But the family has also come out and said that they don't believe Tanner's death is the first death that this police station had tried to cover up. The family is set out to social media to try to find the missing pieces and find connections and start putting everything together. But unfortunately, after about 2008, I haven't seen anything else posted about this case, no further articles, no further information to go off of, and no new updates. So that's pretty much all of the information that I have on this case, and part of the reason I wanted to do this case in the first place was to get his story back out there, get his picture back out there, get people thinking about his case again, and maybe people will come forward with more information that allows the family to finally put those missing pieces together. Knowing what we know, I think there's far too much pointing towards fall play for police to ignore. I think it's really, really frustrating that police have made their official ruling only based on the condition of his body. When you go into an investigation, you have to consider everything. The timeline, the circumstances under which he went missing, the people that he was involved with, what he was doing leading up and the night of his disappearance, whether anybody around him had the motive and the means. Shout out to the Crime Weekly podcast, by the way. They are always discussing things like the the motive and the means, which has definitely made me look at these cases differently. But either way, all of those things considered, they also have to consider the condition of his body. So it's supposed to be a totality of all of those things considered when police determined what happened in a case. But to me, in this case, it seems like police knew all of those things and then saw the condition of the body and ignored literally everything else that they found just saying, oh, he took his own life and just ignored all of the other factors. I want to talk about some of the questions that I have in this case that I haven't seen anywhere else that I think would give us a lot more insight into this case. First, why hadn't the family ever heard of Jeremiah? Was Tanner trying to cover up his friendship with him for whatever reason? Because we know that he clearly had an 
interacted with him before with his own brother. So why had the rest of his family never heard his name? Is there more to the relationship that he didn't want anybody else knowing? Or was he simply hiding this person from his family so that he could continue getting drugs from him without his family's knowledge? What has Jeremiah said about what happened that night? I'm sure police know, but why haven't they released that information? Was there somebody else at Jeremiah's place that night? If so, who? Did he go anywhere else that night or was he at Jeremiah's apartment the entire time? What was Jeremiah's explanation for why his apartment looked like a tornado had passed through? Why was he wearing Tanner's shirt? Because if Tanner did take his own life, when did he do it? Why would he tell his family that he's seeing Jeremiah then go see Jeremiah and hang out with him. We know that he was at his apartment because his hat was there, but then just go take his life right after. Was there something that happened with this interaction that suddenly made Tanner want to take his own life? Or did he just tell his parents that he was seeing Jeremiah as a cover and somehow his hat ended up there in a different way? Or did he go see someone else after seeing Jeremiah that we just don't know about? Why would he tell his family he was going to be back in 30 minutes and specifically ask his mother to make him dinner if he knew that he was going to take his own life? None of that makes absolutely any sense. There is so much to this case that simply does not point to Tanner taking his own life. So then we can go over some of the theories in this case. Now, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because we've pretty much been talking about the two main theories throughout this entire video. Again, police believe that Tanner took his own life, but there is just so much information pointing away from that. So I kind of thought of a couple of theories that surround the idea of foul play and what may have happened and how it might have played out. So the first theory is that Tanner went to Jeremiah's house with the intention of hanging out or doing drugs or whatever it was, but that Jeremiah had other plans. That he used this as an opportunity to retaliate and then beat him up and tortured him for an extended period of time and then put his body into a freezer and then staged his death as a suicide. The other theory is that maybe Tanner went to Jeremiah's house to do drugs and then Tanner overdosed and maybe Maybe Jeremiah staged this entire thing as a suicide to avoid getting in trouble for drugs. Because if he was pretty decomposed, then it's a very big possibility that a toxicology report would not find any drugs in his system. Now, I do personally think that it's absolutely possible and very honestly likely that Tanner went there either to buy drugs or do drugs. That makes perfect sense for why he said he was only going to be gone for a short amount of time visiting a friend. I don't really know any other reason other than to pick something up from someone or do something like that really quick for why you'd only see a friend for a half hour. So I do think that this theory could be totally possible. Or again, maybe he went there with the intent of doing drugs and then Jeremiah attacked him. I do also think it's possible that he went there for something drug related and neither Jeremiah or Tanner had any sort of negative intentions, but then something happened that caused them to get into a fight. Things escalated very quickly, hence the turned over mess in the apartment and that Tanner was killed that way. I do think that that's also very possible. The only thing that I think could explain Tanner taking his own life so last second is if he did go there for something drug related, go to Jeremiah's for something drug related, and then something happened where maybe Jeremiah threatened him to the point where he wanted to take his own life to protect his family or something like that. I do think that that's really the only explanation as to why he would have taken his life so last second. I do think that he he fully intended to come back to his family's house. I don't think he would have asked his mom to make him dinner if he didn't plan on coming back. Again, I think that he planned to come back and that's really the only thing that I can think of that would explain why Tanner would just all of a sudden want to take his own life. Nothing else really makes any sense to me. So those really are the main theories in this case. Again, there are so many other questions in this case that just don't have answers. So it's really hard for me to pin down exactly what I personally believed happened. But I do think that there's so much more to this case than Tanner just simply taking his own life. I think that there has to be other factors involved, whether it be foul play or threat or something like that. I personally, just based on what I know about this case, I think that police are just sort of being 
lazy here and that they just don't want to put in the work to actually find out the answers and that's why they're not doing anything. I think they know that it's a lot more than just a simple explanation of him just going and taking his own life, but I just don't think that they want to put in the resources or the energy to actually figuring out what happened. Either that or Jeremiah has some sort of connection to the police department that we just don't know about and maybe police are helping him cover this entire thing up and that's why they're not doing anything. I don't really know. And I don't want to make baseless accusations here, but at the same time, I think there's so much more to this case than what meets the eye. And I think there has to be a reason why police aren't doing anything and aren't saying anything and aren't releasing enough information. So now I want to hear what you guys think. Do you think that there's more to this case? What do you think truly happened? Let's discuss these thoughts and theories in the comments below. Either way, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. And don't forget to go to acorntv.com and use code Rachel Shannon for a free 30-day trial. Again, promo codes are case sensitive, so make sure you type in the promo code in all lowercase. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye! <laughs>